I want to say hello to everyone who's joined us. Um, there will no doubt be people who will be coming who are still arriving. Um, but now it is my privilege to turn over our program and to begin with our very own uh, beloved President Molly T. Marshall. Thank you so much, Dr. Cindy Beth and dear Eliar. Eleazar, I am so sorry. We have not been colleagues for very long because I greatly appreciate uh, your writing, your influence and the ways in which you have shaped generations of students. So welcome and greetings friends, alums, colleagues, staff, donors, all gathering tonight to celebrate the esteemed work of Dr. Fernandez among us. It's always fitting to honor one described as having a burning center and porous borders. That's what one of your students has written, Dr. Fernandez, which is a wonderful commendation of openness and yet a convictional center that is compelling for others. You have left a graceful imprint on generations of students and that will endure. And I'm sure you will hear that tonight as your colleagues and others reflect on your long fidelity to your vocation uh, in our midst. I wanna thank all of you who have joined tonight for being a part of this festive occasion. It is only right and fitting that we honor one who has given about three decades of his vocation to United Seminary. Actually, seminaries are built, in my judgment, on the vow of stability, people who give themselves to a place and to their calling and make it a hospitable and welcoming space for others. So it is a delight tonight that we welcome one another and that we have this time together to reflect on your good work, Dr. Fernandez. And I hand it over to my dear colleague, Kyle Roberts, Dean of the Seminary. Thank you, Molly. Thank you all for joining together tonight to celebrate uh, the legacy of Dr. Eleazar Fernandez at United. You've all read Dr. Fernandez's bio and many of you know it very well, but a little review on this occasion of reflection and celebration I think is appropriate and worth doing. Eleazar has been a beloved professor, a leader in seminary education, an internationally important voice in liberation theology, and a global theologian for nearly three decades. Eliezer began his tenure at United in 1993 as assistant professor of constructive theology and was promoted to associate professor in 1996. He was awarded tenure in 2000 and promoted to professor of constructive theology in 2004. At United, Dr. Fernandez has taught numerous courses in constructive theology, liberation theology, theological voices from the global south, all kinds of courses in ethics and justice, and the immersion trips that Eliezer has led seem to stand out among alum alumni as especially impactful. Dr. Fernandez has authored and edited many books, numerous articles, book chapters. Among them, Toward a Theology of Struggle, Reimagining the Human, Theological Anthropology in Response to Systemic Evil, a book that I recall assigning to my, uh, my theology, some of my theology classes at Bethel Seminary, A Burning Center, Porous, Bo uh, Porous Borders, Teaching for a Culturally Diverse and Racially Just World, and uh, very recently, Teaching in a World of Violent Extremism, and I'm told a book on theological responses to the pandemic is forthcoming too. I first met Eliezer while I was on faculty at Bethel and was invited to participate in the Evangelical Liberal Dialogue at United. 
As we discussed our respective positions on the question of salvation, I think we were at a Mexican restaurant there on Central, um, Eliezer. We realized we both kind of had to magnify our positions a little bit uh, to exaggerate them just a tad to show uh, some, some real differences there on, on our positions. And I recall Eliezer wondering aloud, who is the real liberal here? <laughs> Last fall was Dr. Fernandez's final term teaching at United. To show his impact at United and how it's continued over these many, many years, um, a student from LA's final course, Meg Mercury, who is here tonight, has a testimony that I would like to ask Meg to share. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, Dr. Fernandez was an incredible professor. He taught constructive theology with intellectual rigor, deep ethical commitment, and good humor. Um, it wasn't unusual for him to quote, say, Paul Tillich and John Denver on the same slide. His lectures drew from an astounding breadth of sources. And because of the ways in which he encouraged us to take our theological construction seriously and personally, what began as my constructive theology final paper is now turning into my master's thesis and is work I hope to continue to build upon at the doctoral level. Dr. Fernandez's encouragement of my work and challenges to my thinking have made me a better and a bolder scholar, and I am deeply grateful to him. Thank you, Meg. And so Dr. Fernandez, for your words of wisdom and faculty meetings, your out of the box perspective on theological education, your pastoral spirit and theological mentoring with students. We are all deeply grateful. We will be providing you with a gift in coming days that you can use to spruce up your home in the Philippines, however you'd like. And I'll add one more thing that I will be proposing to the academic committee of the board that you would be uh, granted emeriti status, professor emeritus professor of constructive theology at United Seminary. We are very grateful for your legacy, for your life, and for your work at United. Thank you. I guess I'm on, huh? So my name's Gail Anderson. I am an alum and former staff member at United. Um, and I am honored to take part in this celebration of the career of Dr. Eliezer Fernandez. I first knew Eliezer as my professor. In fact, I may have taken more classes from him than any other professor. And later we worked together as colleagues Eliezer influenced me in too many ways to mention tonight, but my life and career were powerfully changed by how he opened my eyes and heart to our global reality. So two highlights of many are the weekend retreat at Shalom Hill Farm in Windham, Minnesota that we took part as part of the globalization at our doorstep class. So we visited rural Minnesota to learn about the world. And the other is the evening that we hosted 30 immigrant pastors from many denominations from all over the globe for dinner and conversation in the Strobel Room. And it was a magical evening. So this evening, we invite colleagues to reflect on the impact of Eliezer's career from a variety of perspectives. We will hear from three people, a faculty colleague, alum, and a recent student now also an alum. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak which is also a reflection on how they knew Eliezer in the arc of his career as a teacher and a mentor. Then, after we have heard their stories, we will hear a response from Eliezer. So first, Dr. Mary Farrell Bednarowski, Professor Emeriti of Religious Studies, had been on the faculty for about 17 years when Eliezer came to teach at United. As faculty colleagues, they exchanged ideas, mentored students, shaped the curriculum, 
and laid the groundwork for what United is today. Then, Reverend Mike McMillan is currently serving as pastor at Faith United Church of Christ in Dunedin, Florida, and is a graduate from the class of 2009. Mike not only took classes with Eliezer in New Brighton, but also traveled with him on a global immersion trip to the Philippines. And finally, Lucia Kalinowski is a chaplain resident at Abbott Northwestern Hospital, doing a residency and working towards certification. A graduate from the class of 2021, Lucia had the benefit of learning from Eliezer in the last years of his teaching at United. Please join me in welcoming each of them, starting with Mary, by offering a Zoom wave. Eliezer, if I am still surprised that I'm retired, imagine how astonished I am that you, my much loved, admired, and respected young colleague, are going to retire, at least from the faculty of United Seminary. I'm certain that you're not going to retire from your work of struggling to heal the tribulations of the many worlds you've inhabited for so many years, nor from engaging in all the endless good works that have made you who you are. I could spend my allotted time tonight citing a long list of your publications, the courses you've taught, the services you've rendered to the church and the seminary and the world in general kind of a works righteousness compendium. Luckily, luckily Kyle has already done that. But I have something else in mind. I want to talk about how I've experienced you as my colleague, because you will always be my colleague. That is a bond that can't be broken. The poet Dennis Michael Brown has a line I love that applies perfectly to you. The heart is an intelligent organ. Tonight, I want to talk about your tough and tender heart, which as you've told us so candidly has been broken and mended, broken and mended in endless ways in the years I've known you. A lot of what makes your work so powerful is the fact that you reveal yourself, not just your erudition, but your deep convictions and your emotions, your ongoing questions and your struggles to stay hopeful, and so many touching things about your family, the loving support of Josephine, your love for your daughters, whom I knew as little girls, the flowers in Josephine's garden. In the introduction to Reimagining the Human, you wrote so movingly, our family journey has sharpened my poetic sensibility and creative imagination. That's a wonderful thing to say about your family. In Teaching in a World of Violent Extremism, a more recent book, you said, when the heart is aching, as the nation is in turmoil in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, the bleeding heart, another flower in our garden, nudges me gently from a place of breaking apart to the place of breaking open so that I can contribute to a world of healing, even while bleeding. This gives me a lump in my throat. I admire you as a complex, multidimensional person. You empathize pedagogically in creative ways. I'm thinking of the class you created for students who couldn't travel abroad to fulfill the global studies requirement. You know how to struggle in solidarity with different kinds of people all over the world. You are also very funny. 
you have a laughing heart and a well-developed sense of the absurd. Clyde Steckel remembers standing next to you in line, waiting for commencement professions to, processions to start and enjoying what he calls your hearty humor. You are what I would call, in great appreciation, a bit of a smart ass. In the circles I run in, there is no higher praise. Your laugh is as memorable to me as your lectures in TR 101 in the days we taught that course together. Clyde also vividly remembers your interview for the position at UTS. You demonstrated a sophisticated knowledge and appreciation of both Eastern and Western theologians that Clyde thought was quite rare in his experience. You are an artist with metaphors and images, a theologian with a poet's heart. Burning center, porous borders. I'm obviously not the only one who loves that title is the title of one of your many books. That's a wonderful title. How very extendable that image is into other fields of inquiry. How often I've cited that phrase in the work I've done on women and religion. If there's fire at the center, you argue, there is no need to expend the community's energy in guarding the boundaries. If the ideas and influences that flow back and forth are perceived as gifts rather than threats, the community can offer and receive those gifts without the fear and rigidity that throw sand on the flames of creativity and resilience. Your intelligent heart is a generous heart. You reveal yourself to the benefit of others. The story of your responsibility as a little kid for your family's rice field and therefore their well being, carefully carrying the seeds on your head back and forth along a narrow path, tells us about what has shaped you and gives us images to ponder for our own work. You compare cultivating rice to cultivating hope. Without deep roots, you tell us, our imagination cannot soar to new heights. I will always be grateful for your generosity in writing an essay on Filipino popular Christianity for a volume I edited a few years ago. I loved it the first time I read it, and I loved it even more when I read it again recently. In it, you display the knowledge and sophistication, the cosmopolitan heart, I'm quoting you again, of a highly educated multicultural theologian and scholar, but one who has a heart for the hard won wisdom of the poor, those jeepney drivers, fisher folk, and small farmers whose crucifixion tradition is understandably stronger than their resurrection tradition. You have a heart for the church, both local and global. You are a church person. You have preached and taught and supported church communities all over the world. You work and live on the ground and in the midst. Finally, you live in the world with a hope-filled heart. You are so very open about your struggle to sustain hope in a world that is terrifyingly broken. But without hope, you say, one cannot truly wait or work for a better future. In spite of home, I'm still quoting you, in spite of the association of the future of hope with the future or the not yet, hope is about living in the present. 
as you live into the hope-filled unfolding present of your retirement, I salute you with my own grateful heart. I love you, little brother. Hmm. Hmm. That was <clears throat> beautiful. Wow. And Mary, I've been searching all week for a word to describe Eleazar, just one word, and you nailed it. Smart ass is the word <laughs> I was for all week long. <laughs> As a fellow smart ass, Eleazar, you know, I mean that in, in the best light. With great uh, affection. It, 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 with total affection. I love it. It just sums it all up. <laughs> I want to say what, it, what an honor it is to be here tonight celebrating the retirement of Eliezer, a man of such deep wisdom, insight, and vision, a friend of such gentleness and, and creativity and humor, and a teacher of such profound conviction and commitment. Eliezer, you had and continue to have a major impact on my life as a pastor. And no doubt, no doubt on so many others who are blessed to call you their professor, their teacher throughout your many years at, at United. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to express that sentiment in your honor, my friend, this night. I have to say it's been a fun trip down memory lane as I've, as I've worked on this reflection. And I, I realized how I cannot overstate how important Eliezer's guidance and teaching was to me in that time of my life as I was you know, developing the core of, of the theology that I would soon take out into the world in, in ministry. And for one, Eleazar, um, you were one tough professor. <laughs> I think others will resonate with that. You were one tough professor, but you drove us to be prepared to put the hard work in and to think critically. And second, and more importantly, to especially always think critically when it came to God, to ourselves, to the world around us, and all of creation, and most importantly, our neighbor, our global neighbor. You taught us about, about difference, about how that is to be treasured and held as sacred as a part of the, of the God experience in the globalized world, that all of our global neighbors are sacred. Difference is sacred. And though many of us came into your formidable course, your courses, with ideas of having a healthy respect of, of diversity and difference, and I'll just speak for myself here, you challenged me. You challenged me where I am in my own social location to see it for what it is, for, for who I am with all the experiences and privileges that have shaped me, but then to open my eyes to the world, to the good, and especially to the systemic evil that is all around us and hurts so many people, and then to use my honest location for the good. And that's a lesson I've never forgotten, uh, nor will I ever. Another thing you taught me, and again, I'm just going to say countless others, um, Eliezer, Eliezer, is to never, as Mary, Mary just said, to never, ever give up on hope. In the world that can try to tell us, as it obviously has been doing the past couple of years and, and still is to this day, that, that hope's utopian or that there is none to be seen, you challenged us to never give it up, to never become the cynic especially when the times are bleak. I see that reflected in some of my papers I've been rereading this week, uh, Tripped on Memory Lane, uh, for my constructive theology course, but I really gleaned the, the, that importance from one of your books that's been mentioned several times, Burning Center, Porous Borders, The Church in a Globalized World, that, that you asked me to read and proof before you submitted it for publication, and I can't tell you what an honor that was for me. Um, it was truly, truly an honor. But more than that, by reading that book so closely, I and no doubt so many others were invited into your strong belief in hope to change the world for the better for all people, and your belief that a, a life well-lived is one that is based firmly on a foundation of hope. Now, you wrote, and I'm going to quote you here, thank God it's a different quote than what Mary just said. <laughs> um, and I've used this many times in sermons, uh, and uh, it's one I go to often, cultivating and nourishing a spirituality of hope, a spirituality of hope. 
It's no doubt a tremendous challenge when the world seems to move in a direction or when our determined actions seem to suffer setbacks. It is at this point in which hope takes us to its real depth. It helps us see and relate to the world differently." End quote. You talked about the courage to hope and how hope can lead us to see the world differently. And by doing so, we can make real change in the world, especially in the lives of those who are most vulnerable. So if I had to sum up my theology, it's just that. It's a global spirituality of hope, especially in the, in the bleakest of times. And my ministry then is to pass that on in a world that needs it. I'll say again, I'm sure I speak for many others. The seeds of that strong belief were nurtured through your teaching and through your writing. And I thank you for that, my friend. But I know I don't have a lot of time, but I want to share two quick personal stories. Uh, first, upon my, my graduation uh, from UTS, I was fortunate enough to be uh, invited into the awesome arms of Mayflower Church as a Eli Lilly fellow. And I will never forget this one Sunday morning when I was, I, I, when I was the preacher, and I was still pretty new to the craft of preaching. I just graduated. And I got up to deliver the sermon, and I looked out to the windows, and there, sitting along the side of the church, looking down, you know, through his glasses at me. You all know who El how Eliezer has that kind of look. Looking there, he's got that, that look. It was Eliezer and his family, just kind of staring back over at me. And my eyes went wide, and, and I swear I just about fainted. I mean, Eliezer was one of the most profound theologians I had known. And I thought, oh, my God, I have to preach in front of him. I just about died. So I had that much respect for him. I got through it, and I greeted them after. And I think Eliezer, you tapped me on my shoulder, and he said something like, you did fine, <laughs> which was high praise. <laughs> the Fernandez family joined the, the church, and there began a wonderful couple of years where I was able to do so much with them, working on immigration issues with Josephine. And, of course, a highlight of my life, traveling to the Philippines with Eliezer as my guide, a, a life-changing, eye-opening journey, and one I hope to have a similar experience with again soon, the Florida Conference. Finally, I just want to share one more story. It was 2012, and I accepted a call to Florida to serve Faith United Church of Christ, where I am now, and my family said our goodbyes, and we headed south, and when it came time for my installation uh, that October, I knew there was one person I wanted to preach at that special service, my teacher, my colleague, my mentor, my friend, Reverend Dr. Eliezer Fernandez. Now, Eliezer was gracious enough to accept my invitation, and he flew down, and he stayed with us, setting the tone for my own ministry here with an awesome sermon. They're still talking about it to this day, Eliezer. <laughs> At some point during his time with us, we went to Clearwater Beach and we're sitting on, on beach chairs and we're enjoying a beer. Unfortunately, it was not a San Miguel. Um, and while we sat, a, a dragonfly flew frantically all around us and I was swatting it away. You know, I have like a bug phobia kind of thing. Glad I live in Florida, right? <laughs> so I thought it left. But suddenly the dragonfly landed it landed on me. And I freaked out. And I went, ah, and I flung that, that dragonfly off of me. And as it flew off, we both, Eliezer and I just watched, almost kind of in a suspended animation. And then a seagull swooped right on in and ate the dragonfly in mid-flight. And we just sat there and for a while. And finally, Eliezer broke the silence. And he just calmly said, that dragonfly was coming to you for protection, looking at you as a protector. It was drawn to you for safety, and you turned it away. And then he chuckled. You know, Eliezer, you have that laugh. Maybe you're trying to assuage my guilt a bit. I, I, I'm guessing that was it. But I knew, I knew in the moment that he said that, that it was true. And his teachings were suddenly all summed up for me. The borders are porous. The walls of division are thin. The paradigm of separateness and division is a dangerous illusion. We are all connected in this world, on this earth together. Yes, even me and a dragonfly, all of creation. I threw out all the paradigms that day. And it stands for me as one of the simplest, yet greatest of lessons from, was, from one of the wisest of teachers. I have no doubt so many others have similar stories. So on behalf of all of us <laughs> who are blessed to have been your students, 
I say thank you, Professor. I wish you a blessed retirement, Eleazar, with plenty of time to spend with your wonderful family and plenty of more experiences to, to have back in the Philippines. And I thank you for all of the wisdom and the inspiration you passed on to students just like me and so many others. So peace be with you and your family, my friend, in this time. Now, please, please go and have some fun. You have earned it. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucia Kalinowski. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a recent UTS alum and current chaplain resident in the Twin Cities. Uh, I'm honored to have been asked to speak tonight, and I'm thrilled to be celebrating Dr. Fernandez's career and retirement. I have to admit that I wasn't sure I was going to enjoy Dr. Fernandez's class when I originally signed up for it. I was planning to become a chaplain after graduation, and I was taking constructive theology because I had to. I was sure I would never use it again. During one of my first class sessions, I asked Dr. Fernandez about the difference between practical theology and constructive theology. He bristled and muddied the distinction for me. The first of many overly simplified distinctions he would kindly muddy for me, saying that this implied that constructive theology wasn't practical and that there is nothing more practical than a good theory. After that, Dr. Fernandez and I headed off. I think I, would, I knew I would like him when, one time after finishing a lecture, he minimized his PowerPoint window and I noticed a folder on his desktop labeled in all caps, jokes. Not only is Dr. Fernandez one of the most effective lecturers I've ever had, but he's also one of the most poetic and absolutely, certainly, without a doubt, one of the funniest. I went on to take four classes with Dr. Fernandez. One of my favorite things about Dr. Fernandez's teaching style, and I think his thinking generally, is how open he is to different materials and thinkers. Dr. Fernandez is the kind of thinker who may cite subcomandante Marcos and John Denver, not just in the same lecture, but on the same slide. This openness extended to the way he created space for students to engage each other and to engage him. As much wisdom as he has to share, he never doubted the wisdom students had to share. He never rushed us, he never diminished us. Even when a student had ideas very different or even directly opposed to his own. It has recently become even more apparent to me how wrong I was to think that I wouldn't use constructive theology as a chaplain, at least not the way that Dr. Fernandez teaches constructive theology. As I entered my chaplaincy residency, my familiarity with different conceptions of the Trinity, which as a Quaker, I found baffling. When I read them in Dr. Fernandez's class, helped me more quickly understand the Lutheran and Catholic residents in my cohort when they spoke about their own theology. I have found myself remembering moments from Dr. Fernandez's class on theology of migration when talking to immigrant patients describing the feeling of being betwixt and between. I have found myself thinking of readings with, from Dr. Fernandez's class on the theology of US minorities when working with African-American, Asian-American, indigenous and American and Latin American patients and colleagues. Perhaps most strikingly, when discussing social location with my chaplain resident cohort, I tried to describe the process of mediation, and I found a, myself saying, you see, there's no objective observation. It's turtles all the way down. At that moment, I knew that Dr. Fernandez's voice will be a voice in my head for the rest of my ministry. While the exact ways are still becoming apparent, he is a voice who has made me and so many other students more observant, more critical, more theologically skillful, and ultimately kinder. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, and congratulations on your retirement.
Is it uh, what's next? It Me? is you. It is you. Yes. Dr. Fernandez. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Mary, uh, Mike, and Lucia, and thank you, uh, Gail, and uh, Kyle, and uh, Molly, and I hope to hear others as well later. This is really a significant occasion in my life, and thank you, Cindy Beth, for having this uh, occasion. I thought that I would just simply fade away, but you said no, <laughs> no. We, you, you will have, uh, uh, we will give you time uh, to celebrate your retirement, and thank you for doing this. Sometime in June of 1993, after a long drive from Tennessee. My wife and I, Josephine, and with our two young daughters arrive in a strange place called Minnesota. And in a quiet campus of United, one gloomy afternoon feeling like strangers. At that moment, I was wondering why we were here. Is this really a place for me and for my family? As days turned into months, and months into years, and years into decades, I sometimes reminisce that kind of question, now with the gift of hindsight and gift of years. We could have been somewhere else, of course, but the reality is that we dared to choose the place and open the possibility that this could be the place where we could bloom. And we have not regretted that decision and the journey that followed. If thunder follows lightning, so does gratitude follows grace. If there's a word that I must say before proceeding farther, that word is gratitude. I am grateful for the graciousness, generosity, and hospitality of UTS community. Without this, we could not have survived, endured, much less thrive in a foreign land. As a person in the diaspora, there has always been that inner voice calling me to go home or to come home, much more so when I hear people say, go home to where you came from. I have always been longing for home, which is not only about place, but finding a sense of place, of finding voice, hospitality for me, as a diaspora person is critical. It's critical for survival. It's critical for our flourishing. Although there have been challenges, I have found colleagues and fellow travelers who embody the value of hospitality. And because of this hospitality, a diaspora person like myself has found a home. This is what it means to have a diaspora heart that Mary uh, mentioned. Thank you for saying that. It is a heart that has found every place a home and even more has found a home in the journey. The journey is home. My teaching and scholarship have been nourished by the generosity and hospitality of the seminary, its administration, professors, staff, and students. Starting as a professor requires a lot of help, and much more so if you come from another place and another culture. It means learning from faculty colleagues 
who have been ahead in the profession, not only about teaching, but also about the work of various academic programs and committee, committee work. In the day-to-day -day encounter, mentoring into the profession is happening. To that, I'm truly grateful to my colleagues. I'm grateful for United for giving me enough space, especially through elective courses to pursue subjects of my interest. Besides teaching the regular courses, such as constructive theology, I had the privilege of teaching courses that include globalization at our doorsteps uh, mentioned by a Gale. Interfaith engagement, mobility in a globalized world and global immersion trips and other courses about uh, uh, dealing with uh, racial ethnic minorities. As part of the global justice requirement, I took immersion trips to the Philippines, to Hawaii, to Israel, Palestine, and for those who could not make it, globalization at our doorsteps. In southwestern Minnesota, students saw how globalization is happening or was happening in their midst, which made me think of writing an essay with the title, Little House on the Prairie Meets the Third World. The immersion trips had been among the most transformative experiences in my students' life. Testimonies of students who participated in these trips are so inspiring. Part, I believe, and this was mentioned also, of the transformative learning moment was the student's close encounter with their professor who made himself vulnerable in the teacher-student encounter by embodying integrity and authenticity. In one immersion trip, a revelatory encounter happened. In the house of one of the fisher folks in the Philippines, I noticed an aquarium with small fish. I asked our host what kind of fish they were. And he said that the fish is tilapia and that their tilapia siblings in the wider lake already weighed about two pounds. There was a big difference in size between the fish in the aquarium and those that were out in the wider lake. Then I turned to my students and tried to explain what we had witnessed. Just like the fish, if we stay in our aquarium, we will not grow. Our world would remain small and narrow. On the other hand, if we take the risk and venture into the wider world, we open ourselves to the possibility of making our hearts as large as the world. My scholarship has thrived at United. The main reason is the space that allowed me to pursue my interest. As I look back at the trajectory of my writings, it started with a dissertation turned into a book that was focused on the Philippines. Then it shifted to my diaspora experience in a dream unfinished and America of our hearts to broader topics such as reimagining the human and to the global issues, burning center and porous borders to issues related to the practice of teaching, teaching for a culturally diverse and racially just world, teaching for a multi-faith world and teaching in a world of violent extremism and will be out in a month, an edited volume. The title is uh, Threshold Dwellers in the Age of Global Pandemic. And 
our professors at United uh, are contributing essays in that volume. It's difficult to leave a place in which you have given about three decades of your life. Great memories, not nostalgia. But the time has come for me to formally say goodbye or to retire as if work is the center of our lives. This does not mean that I will stop doing the kind of work such as teaching and writing, which has become a part of my identity, but I will have more time to do the things that I need to give my attention to, especially my family, and get involved in projects that my wife and I would like to focus on. There was a father who never hug his daughter goodbye without saying this blessing over her. And I quote, may every place you be make it hard for you to live. May every person you love make it hard for you to say goodbye. It takes a lot of real wrestling to understand the pain and beauty of this kind of blessing to be happy anywhere that you never want to live. That is painful. To love so much that makes it difficult for you to say goodbye, that's painful as well. It's a difficult blessing, but one of the greatest blessings we can have. As I close my years at United, I can only hope that my diaspora life my teaching, speaking, writing, and yes, my living has helped broaden our horizons, deepened our compassion, and widened our connections to the world around us. Thank you, United, for your generosity and hospitality. May your decisions and actions be guided by your hopes, not by your fears. When guided by fears, your imagination shrinks and your heart constricts. Sail boldly and confidently in the direction of your dreams and follow your bliss. Thank you. Dr. Fernandez, thank you for that valedictory on your wonderful time uh, in the midst and the graceful imprint that you have left on generations of students. It's my privilege to offer a blessing on behalf of our community. And I quote the words of the Nuke Dimitis, the, the words of Simeon that we find in Luke. Now let your servant depart in peace with the words ringing in his heart, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Go with our blessing and with deep gratitude for your faithful vocation. You have done well. And your students and your colleagues remain your letters of recommendation for the life that you have offered to them and the ways in which they will carry your legacy onward. God bless you, dear brother, in these years that you will continue to serve and you will always remain in our hearts, truly.